эти песни. Ага. I'm a facilitator, psychotherapist, and just uh, two words I'm going to tell you about process work, process-oriented approach, which is a multidisciplinary approach uh, into understanding the human nature, which uh, derives from the uh, Jungian psychology, and the founder of this method is Arnold Mindel, which combines process uh, kind of body oriented and transpersonal um, approach and also quantum physics in the world process work exists for more than 50 years in ukraine for more than 15 years and uh, uh, at the moment for today we have two official organizations which is the ddi uh, institute for deep democracy and our organization of process oriented uh, institute of process oriented uh, work in ukraine which is from the third day of full-scale invasion uh, supports Ukrainians and uh, through the first three months of full-scale invasions we had the support meetings every day at the moment we still have our support meetings but they we usually hold them for one two times a week we have the best uh, educators and teachers from all around the world involved with us who have the experience of working with uh, trauma events and with working with in war zone uh, and in uh, war conflicts. And this is why we kind of uh, uh, develop this, uh, uh, this direction uh, further uh, with very important projects and through the support of our teachers and through also the, uh, through, uh, the help and support of our fellow uh, of, 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 of participants, uh, we were able in uh, August uh, last year uh, open the institute, and uh, the, in, in this meantime, we were able to implement uh, several important projects. This is the support groups, also the history of Ukraine project that we presented in Ukraine for Ukrainians and also for uh, uh, many. Uh, uh, many other communities around the world. Also an intensive that we had for the volunteers uh, who uh, are involved in the war effort in Lviv, Western Ukraine. We had an offline event. And also in course of this whole process, we uh, had this uh, important project imp implemented, the project Regeneration, the initiator of which is Yaroslava Kotmironova, and she is a co-founder of the Institute of uh, um, Process Work uh, of Ukraine, and um, so she's going to tell you a little bit more about Regeneration uh, project and also other work that uh, we do together. So the word is to you, Yaroslava. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. I think, can you hear me, Victoria? Yes, it's okay. I just uh, unmute. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, uh, my name is Yaroslava Kodmironova, and I'm a coordinator and initiator of Regeneration Project. And um, I want to start, first of all, uh, to say that um, I met a full-scale invasion in Kyiv. Together with my husband, two four-year-old daughter, friends, relatives, we have been living in the subway station uh, as an bomb shelter for two weeks. And um, we were staying there for no possibilities to go out for several days, for example. And on the third day of invasion, I came up with an idea that, um, with an idea, and it was picked up by my colleagues from Ukraine, and we organized so-called supporting meetings uh, with international specialists and Ukrainians. Um, and um, I must say that groups appeared to be so helpful and in time for many people from different places of Ukraine. And we were so happy to watch how in the center of the war, different participants were choosing to live, you know, uh, they were choosing to help each other and share uh, their sacred our frightening thoughts uh, with us so frankly. And um, somehow they were creating their reality, trying to build a future for the next generations that during the war. Uh, within the half year um, of daily work, these groups turned uh, into the systemic project, so-called Regeneration. And it was supported by Olena Pinchuk Foundation and the Institute of Social and Political Psychology of Ukraine. Uh, we, we are still working now. Uh, I must say that uh, we have uh, 
50 mm -hmm. trained therapists and 1,300 1, uh, beneficiaries who got a professional psychological support online in groups. And this April, we are going to start uh, the third wave of the project in April, at the end of the uh, April. You can stay, you can become a part of it um, to have more professional support. Please use the link uh, to know more. We will leave it in the chat a, a bit later. Um, the main principles of supporting groups are online to feel safety anywhere where you are staying, uh, to have a connection with everybody. Online is very important than uh, supporting community uh, to, to trust, to trust. Vicarious therapy to become uh, not only a witness of tragedy, but a witness of healing too, to help yourself witnessing that. Reclaiming to have power back and the post-traumatic growth uh, to have new possibilities after difficult experience. Uh, the sensory impact of the experience is essential. So we pay a lot of attention to it in our project. And work on inspiration uh, future is crucial, important for small and big groups now in Ukraine and I think in the world, because uh, we are going to be an ancestors for our generation in future. Mm -hmm. And um, in this project, Regeneration, we used process-oriented uh, approach, psychology and body-oriented psychology uh, and uh, trauma therapy too. And uh, in process-oriented approach, uh, there are some two phenomena like high dream, the best of all that can be, and the low dream, the worst of all can that can be. And um, the reality is uh, somehow and somewhere in the middle and ignoring the low dream, uh, it kept captivating the illusions and uh, ignoring the high dream leads to failures and uh, loss of all senses. And... Um, I really feel now, maybe you too, I can say that there is there are a lot of low dreams uh, about Ukraine uh, and about world um, and future of the world or Ukraine. Uh, uh, and not without reason, of course, because we have a lot of losses, uh, sorrow, uh, losses, helplessness. Uh, but for every person, it is very important to see not only threats, but also to feel a yearning for life, I think, and uh, to be open to inspiration, to have the strengths to motivate themselves uh, to create a new reality or to change what is very destroying for themselves or for the country or for the world. That is why uh, we decided to invite Dr. Marcus Bissi to talk about future, futures thinking and how to be successful uh, ancestor for new generations. And um, this open meeting is initiated and supported by the international project Reclaiming uh, Ukraine and Australia as a part of the implementation of the joint project uh, Regeneration, a joint project of uh, Olena Pinchuk Foundation and the Institute of Process Work in Ukraine with the scientific and methodological support of the Institute of Social Political uh, Psychology in Ukraine. And this meeting was informationally supported by the Coordination Center of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine, Mental Health UA, as a part of uh, the Ukrainian uh, Mental Health Program, uh, How Are You? It called How Are You? Initiated by Olena Zelenska. And now I want to present you our moderator of today's event, Alan Richardson, psychotherapist with more than 40, 45 years of practice and a trainer, supervisor, He's a mentor of the Regeneration Project too, and the initiator of the educational project Reclaiming. And uh, I want to give the floor to you, Alan, please welcome. I can see you on the screen. Thank I'm you. good to see you, you again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I love hearing the, all the background and the development over time. And um, we can now say this is an extra development. 
to have Marcus with us. Extra розвиток, додатковий розвиток. Мати зараз Маркуса тут з нами це такий поворотний момент, тому що так як ви вже і сказали, що два роки вторгнення, втрати, фрагментація всього суспільства, спільноти білі і про можливість далі жити. And then flounder in young ways uh take a lot of a lot of courage and a lot of strength. So I know this because I've been running um you know the the Saturday morning you know support group with you all for now two years. So lots of beautiful kind familiar faces I see and it's from that group that I start looking at what's the science in creating history and what's the science in creating how history can inform the future and i discovered that there is a science in the futurist futures thinking style and that is as i read around i found this amazing colleague of mine who uh lives very nearby we have a lot of things in common and you now have two australians on your screen and an open invitation so marcus welcome very welcome to the group Welcome to this team of wonderful people. Um I have to give you some idea. Marcus works at a place called the University of Sunshine Coast. It's only in Australia that would you have a university named the Sunshine Coast. It's a it's a beautiful area and it's the epitome of Australian landscape and and culture. Um Marcus himself is an incredibly well written well developed and the first time i spoke to him i said to him his writing was sublime because as an academic he writes in a way it was so creative and developing so feel free to get your hands on any of his writing put it through chat gbt get a translation and you'll see the sublime deep understanding of how futures thinking does have a basis to how individual humans can get traction in developing their world so it's with that regard that i i developed this connection with marcus and it it won't stop here i know the guys that is is impressively wonderful i know you'll enjoy what he has to say i know i have a series of questions that will challenge him but he's already seen the questions so he's he's here to to do it so with that thank you marcus very much i appreciate you being here on a saturday afternoon in australia warm day and uh, thank you for your time and attention and sharing your expertise thank you very much Thank you very much, Alan. Um, how do I live up to an introduction like that? It's very hard. I, I don't don't believe half of what he says, probably. But, uh, that's an Australian sense of humour coming through there. And I, I hope that uh, having some of you, at least having spent some time over the last few years with Alan, are probably somewhat familiar with the Australian sense of humour. Every culture has its own unique flavour of humour. Um, and... Uh, so anyway, that will come through at times, no doubt, in our conversation. I'm really honoured to be here, and I want to thank uh, all of you for showing up for a start. But I also want to thank you, know, um, Miroslava, you for stepping in, um, and our beautiful translator, and and so on. It's it's really important to have community, and I believe completely in, in the power of community uh, to foster a kind of resilience in our hearts, souls, you know, because we are part of things that are so much bigger than we can even get our heads around. You know, we live in the day to day, we've got to find food, we've got to feel secure or safe. And in your context, that's often quite a struggle. And yet other things are going on. And for me, that access to those other things comes through developing a kind of imagination, a kind of curiosity about what it is to be 
human in my skin, in my family, in my community, in my neighborhood, city, country, and so on. And that's mm, confirm. I have to confirm something. Hang on for one sec. Yeah. Um, I hope that didn't mess anything up, Anastasia. It's still going well. Um, so where was I? So for me, then, the, the, the invitation for all of us is to start thinking outside the box. The first image that I have in the PowerPoint here, Ukraine Futures Thinking, has the beautiful image of a, a kind of sculpted mind, face, head, but the top half is a cage and the bird is flying out. And that is a challenge. That's a challenge when there it is there. So uh, it's a challenge when so much of what is happening in our world is actually closing down the ability to think freely. Because of course, when there's threat and danger and so on, when you're being invaded as you are, and violence becomes part of the general grammar of communication, you could say, we, we obviously tend to shut down. And for me, then, the invitation is to start becoming imagination activists. We need to resist the pressure of violence, of invasion, uh, through our own emotional relationship with our inner world and the co-creative possibilities that arise out of the kind of work that you have been doing with Yaroslava and co and Alan on the Saturday mornings, these gatherings, the role that we uh, that is played by our social abilities to resist oppression is very, very important. Now I want to continue that. And the other thing I want to say before I move into the uh, talk proper is that futures or the future is something that, of course, does not exist in at one level. But it, all, it really does exist all around us in the architecture of our politics, our language, our culture, and our traditions, the kind of lived experiences that you've all had as individuals. The futures, plural, is important because my future is not the same. Look, Alan lives down the road, but our futures and our pasts have been quite different in some respects with interesting overlaps at different moments. Now, I'm... I work as an historian as well as a futurist. I have a background in education, particularly alternative kinds of education, because I've always been looking for ways to think outside the box, for ways to free my imagination and to share my explorations in that field with young children through to adults. So I'm teaching at a university now. Um, and of course, that means I'm working not with children anymore, but with people, some of many of them will be teaching children. So for me, then, I want to say that some of our future thinking needs to sound crazy, ridiculous, foolish in the face of the realities that we face. If I were to say, you know, that tomorrow there's going to be world peace. Yeah, like out of that old movie that I can't remember what it was, but there was this, you know, world peace. That seems crazy. We, we've got not just the issue in your own country, but we have issues all over the world where violence is being committed against uh, innocent people, uh, defenseless civilians and so on. So that's a crazy idea. But is it so crazy that we should just say, forget about it? Let's just throw that out. We'll, we don't need to think about that. That's ridiculous. We need to be thinking about how to get food on the table tomorrow, how to deal with the injuries and trauma and so on. It's not though that these things are mutually exclusive. I think it's really healthy to have crazy ideas. I have uh, quite a few every day probably. Um, and I think we need to practice having crazy ideas, but not just on my own. Then I tell my wife or my kids or my colleagues at the university or my students, many of whom do think I'm slightly crazy, but the point is that we should be sharing our crazy ideas because out of these, just like uh, Yaroslav is um, telling us that she was sitting, you know, in a subway with her husband and kid, you know, and suddenly she has this crazy idea. And what do we have? We have all of you folks here working with Victoria and Alan and, and, and 
you know, working towards what I would call optimal or more positive, more open futures. Okay, so that's my introduction. Um, let's move on then. So we have a first slide. Yes, the second one. Sorry, second slide. Yeah. Uh huh. Futures okay. For individuals. Mm -hmm. How do humans create their concept of futures? That's something I'm really very interested in, and the role of those processes in the formation of what you might call destiny. All of us live within culture. Culture, in my mind, is the sum of history that we are embedded in. It's not high culture like art galleries and museums. That's part of it, but that's a subset. Culture is the literally because we are cultural animals. As human beings, we have cultural brains. We use language and symbol body language with so many things that we're working with at once all of this is shaped by culture i travel a lot and when i'm in different countries i notice the different ways people walk the different ways they move their hands when they're talking different kinds of humor that will trigger laughter or sadness you know what 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 are those elements that trigger sadness some kinds of cultures are more sentimental some are more pragmatic i see this all the time and i'm sure that many of you have seen it as well so how do we create concepts of the future we turn to culture as a data set and of course what do we turn to it with we turn to it with our intelligence our minds but also with the habits that we've been conditioned with or into you might say those habits, obviously, are part of who we are. They're part of our identity. So as we turn our creative intelligence to this question of how do we generate futures that are more positive, for instance, for Ukraine, post whatever it is that happens in, when you know the invasion ceases in one form or another, how do we imagine beyond that? It's, it's difficult in a condition of stress to imagine freely but the alternative is to go back to business as usual whenever what it is that's stressing you uh, is resolved business as usual is certainly better because you're not being shot at or bombed or whatever okay but it uh, i think most of us would agree that the world that we inhabit even in its safest zones is not a world that's equitable, that's not a world that's free. There are many conditions that oppress the human, the social. There's also many conditions that oppress the ecological. And for me, you can't really separate those things. So when we start thinking beyond a cessation of hostilities, for instance, what can you imagine? Going back and repairing your home, planting vegetables again in the garden, or maybe something more. Maybe a new kind of politics is emerging in the kind of creative engagements that you have all been engaged in. A new politics. What does peace mean? How do we approach a concept that's so alluring, it's so attractive, and yet it seems so elusive? These are really important questions. And, you know, some of the process that I will talk about or touch on and the way Alan and I are going to talk once I finish this presentation, uh, these are processes that uh, may unlock some possibility for us all, wherever we are on the planet, to think out of the box, to think beyond the horizon of the immediate issues that we face. I will be arguing later that we have multiple horizons and, and that thinking across multiple horizons begins the process of thinking our way out of the cultural traps we are in where violence is the only way we solve a problem, for instance. So I think I've answered my second question there, which is why is this important? Um, perhaps I could also refer to the concept of the ancestor of the future. 
the ancestor of the future is a, a really useful concept because it means that we need to think multi-generationally or intergenerationally. I think it's really useful to think seven to 10 generations out. That's about three to 400 years into the future, maybe, given that our lifetimes are, are longer now than they were you know, 200 years ago. So to think intergenerationally is part of what futures thinking is about. What would you like your great great grandchildren to experience in their world as Ukrainians? Maybe being a Ukrainian will be less important then than it is now because we might have become more global citizens, or maybe we will become more localized. There, there are political historical forces that are pulling us towards a global awareness, but also pushing us down into more local expressions. This is something that I think is worth exploring. I want to say a few things now about what is this future stuff that I'm talking about. The first thing, and I've just changed um, screen, some important thoughts for you. I'll just wait for the screen to catch up. Okay. So the futures thinking allows us to explore futures that we wish for, optimal futures, inclusive of others, inclusive of the more than human too. So the kind of futures thinking that I do is aiming at what is it that we would like to achieve in a best of all worlds and how do we get there and how do we, and, and how do we even allow ourselves emotionally to think about that. Okay, it's also important to note that future thinking is based on a powerful set of, I think, very simple tools mostly that work, you know, across the physical, social, economic, cultural, spiritual, and even mysterious shifts. Those things that I said we don't know we, uh, uh, we're part of, but I'm sure we are at the, when I was beginning this talk. Okay, so this is the sort of stuff. So we've got tools, lots of tools. Uh, I've already shared some with Alan, and I'm going to touch on two briefly uh, later in this talk. So it's playful. It should be exciting, can be elegant, very elegant. But sometimes when you're working with people uh, who are really struggling with stuff, it can be clunky, challenging, and overwhelming. Okay? It really depends who you've got in the room. It depends on the, on the day uh, as much as anything else. It depends on what's happening outside the door as well. So this Playfulness then moves into some other spaces, though. It can be, a, it, futures thinking, of course, has its dark side. Futures thinking can be elites getting futurists to help them plan how, to, how do they invade a country like Ukraine and successfully win the battle. How do we win the battle for the minds, not just the bodies? Futures thinking is what drives a lot of the more toxic kinds of media. Uh, futures thinking was, I mean, you just think of any brutal regime, they've got their futurists too. They don't call themselves futurists. They're strategists. They're often in the military. They might have economic uh, degrees and so on. Or they might be engineers. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not throwing stones at engineers or economists. It's just that they're the kind of people that, you know, oppressive regimes will call in and, you know, uh, draw on their intelligence and their knowledge to create futures that privilege an elite as opposed to creating better futures for all. I think it's really worth acknowledging the dark side in all of these. things. And the last thing I'd say is that it's communal. It's co-creative. We're not alone, okay? We actually, as cultural beings, we're never alone. We're working with, um, even with the deep memories of the past uh, as we frame our reality. We can talk more about that. I think we'll probably end up talking quite a bit about that with Alan as well. So what are the dynamics at play? Okay, I'm changing slide again. So futures for a nation, what are the dynamics? Well, the nation has internal dynamics. And of course you're dealing with invasion and violence, but there are also other forms of dynamics. And dynamics falls across all of those categories that I gave you before, the physical, the planetary, the, the natural, the social, the cultural, the, the spiritual, and so on. These are all dynamics that you would say are internal 
to an, a Ukrainian consulate. But there are external dynamics too. There is the global, global sorry, <laughs> geopolitical context, one in which, you know, uh, there was uh, support from various major geopolitical powers to help Ukraine. And that support's been dwindling, part, partially because of the politics at home in those countries, but also partly because of, you know, the Israeli-Hamas-Palestinian uh, mess that's unfolding and other things. So there are geopolitical contexts. There are so also economic contexts that are framing how local home populations see aid to another country. It's We are becoming somewhat isolationist again. There's the rise of the right wing across the planet. And the right wing, of course, is never shy in using violence to achieve its ends. So these are some of the dynamics, and you know we can talk about those when Alan and I have our discussion. And you know how do how do you respond? The question is, what happens when our Ukraine is being invaded and destroyed? Well, one of the things that happens is that people like you start talking and start thinking about ways out of what would be uh, what could become very easily a very negative. What is yours? I love that idea that you were using. Um, Yaroslava, uh, the low dream. How you know we get caught in this low dream. A low dream is subhuman existence, acceptance of violence and trauma as just part of the, I guess, the cultural uh, memory and psyche of a people. We've come through multiple iterations of that over many generations. Europe is one of the most traumatized parts of the world in many respects, traumatized by its own violences to its own people. Then of course we have colonial trauma as well and other things. And of course the relationship of Russia with Ukraine is tainted with those colonial dynamics. So what happens? Well one that from my perspective, people need to start thinking out of the box. Let's keep moving. So that leads us then to low dream, high dream. Open futures, closed futures. So the question I think, and this is a question that we really need to come to grips with is whose future are we living in? It's an abstract question, but it has very concrete implications. Whose future? Are we living in Putin's future, Zelensky's future, your future? Are we perhaps actually living in futures that we don't recognize that have been seeded through uh, culture and tradition or through uh, the, the media sources that you rely upon? How much choice or agency, how much, how much freedom do we have? Okay, or do we feel we have? Our psychic health, our psychological health, our emotional health depends on the sense that we have some level of agency, some level of freedom with, uh, uh, in our own world, in our own small bubble to achieve limited and sometimes not so limited ends. Pain and trauma will often lead to a closed future, whereas optimism, the building of optimism, and that thing that calls us into the world, this yearning, is what might be considered elements or necessary ingredients to an open future. These are very important concepts. And I would go back to that. Whose future are we living in? And I think that's something that we need to deal with. Now, part of thinking about the future is also thinking about how do we time the future? This is a short poem here, but I'm not going to read it to you. It's it's just something that uh, in time, you know, the, the PDF will be shared with you. I see that it's, I've just changed the timing of the future here. So I'll just wait for the next slide to pop up. So um, this is a poem that I wrote thinking about. It kind of encapsulates aspects of my own philosophy. And I do, I think in poetry often, I read poetry. I hope you all read some poetry sometimes. And I hope that your primary education didn't destroy, or your high school education didn't destroy your love of poetry. Poetry is important because it gives us metaphors for thinking, okay? So for me, <clears throat> how do we time the future? is something that uh, the tools that I'm going to show you shortly um, 
will enable us to start thinking about because it's not uh, it's not a given that any future is going to come about. Worst case futures, low dream futures, are Ukraine as a colony of Russia. High, uh, you know, high dreams are those in which Ukraine maintains its independence and comes through this stronger and more uh, equipped to deal with, you know, optimal futures for its citizens. One in which the trauma in, uh, and so on uh, of violence. You know, the kind of stuff that your your soldiers are experiencing, for instance, actually has a meaningful place beyond being the sort of hollowed out heroes that those poor soldiers from the First World War and the Second World War came back, but there was nothing there to support them. I think we have, you know, higher levels of compassion in our societies, and we also have the, the skills, the skills that uh, Yaroslav was describing, for instance, uh, to uh, support people who really have been damaged through the experiences that you're going through now. So this brings me back to the imagination. What is the imagination? How often do we think about it? We could go to the next slide now, thanks. I have to say that these little images, these little drawings that I'm drawing upon, they're from one of my students from a master's class I ran a couple of years ago. And she just did all these little drawings along the way which she shared with me. So I've just cut little bits out of them from some of the talks, conversations we had. So one of the things that we can do in a default world, a world where our imagination is crushed, is we can walk backwards into the future. In other words, we walk uh, as though the past is shaping everything about our futures, our expectations of the future. This is what it means to be Ukrainian. This is what it means to be a Ukrainian man, a Ukrainian woman. This is what it means to be um a maybe you know a local uh, farmer or a local producer or a shop owner this is what also what it means to be a counselor and so on and an educator so we can our, our imaginations can be colonized by the past so that's what the image is about so we've got culture and history we've got biography we've got education and media and biology and conditioning all shaped dimensions of our imagination. I see the imagination as a powerful resource. And one of the things that I think about a lot is the way to engage the imagination proactively in healing. Because we often exclude or shut down or deny aspects of possible healing pathways simply because our imaginations don't have a category for it to go in or to fall in. And of course, our brains, in order to function, create categories. Um, I noticed also that uh, Yaroslava mentioned uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinarity, working between the disciplines. That's so important because each discipline has its own form of making truth or making knowledge or whatever we want to call that. And when I, if I were just to be a historian, I would have a very historian's perspective, which is all the things that have happened in Europe, the, the you know the the uh, the lived tensions between the so during the Soviet Union between its various subjugated peoples, then the Soviet Union breaks down. I'd, I'd be going into that narrative, right? But that's not a very that's not an enabling narrative. And I think we need, imagination needs to be released. We need to think out of the box so we can develop an enabling narratives, okay, that will help us. So if I use the, um, the metaphor of the hacker. You can be an imagination hacker. How do we hack the imagination? Okay, so I see um, culture in some respects, just as though, just as a computer program would see the algorithms in front of them. The algorithms, I guess it's really well captured in that old movie, The Matrix, uh, where, you know, the world that the, everybody's living in is an algorithmic. Um, but I think we can cultivate through the imagination what I call anticipatory algorithms. You know, and that we can draw on anticipatory tools to stimulate this co-creation. The little image on the side here is where I was talking about cultural evolution. Culture does evolve and it evolves much faster than our genetics. 
very simple example. Some of you possibly have gluten or lactose intolerance, for instance. We've got, what, uh, 200 people here. Some of you must have that, okay? That's because your body has not caught up with, I'm just going to put my phone to see if it's being at me. Uh, it's because our bodies haven't caught up with the culture of foods that we now ingest. Our bodies take way longer, thousands of years to keep, to catch up, to create the kind of uh, physical um, technology, you could say, or machinery, the physical machinery to digest things that we've never been exposed to. For instance, lactose. I'm hoping that that example makes sense. So it says here in the little image, Genetics is slow, but culture is larger and faster. And we have cultural senses. I list five of them there. These are called the future senses. Memory, how do we remember? How is memory crafted and shaped by our cultures, by our own biographies and, you know, the kind of education you have, the, the kind of families you've grown up in, the locality, not just, you know, Ukraine, but, you know, what does it mean to be in Kiev? At, at Kiev, memory might be quite different from a memory from somewhere else okay foresight is what emerges from our memory foresight is how do, it's what i was talking about with imagination um how do we imagine beyond the boundaries of what we've been given by our own culture and of course we can have strategic foresight which is kind of limited i want to um grow up to be uh, a wealthy entrepreneur i better go and do an mba and so on uh, so that's foresight but that's really more like strategy the kind of foresight we're talking here is the ability to imagine beyond what is okay and that calls into action the third one there voice voice is your ability to achieve what you are imagining this could be at an individual level but it could also be collective co-creative, something that enables us to become more, um, what would be the word, uh, more effective agents of change in the world that we live in. Depending on how our sense of voice, our sense of freedom, agency, ability to function, that feeds into the degree to which I can be optimistic about the future. Optimism dies when choice is crushed okay so we need to can you repeat that sorry marcus can you repeat that optimism is the uh, optimism you just said dies. optimism dies when the future is crushed in other words when choice is crushed when when our ability to find pathways out of where we are okay um it's one of the reasons why prison has been used to uh, against political dissidents to crush them okay to shut down any ability to function and behind it all is sits this thing i call yearning it's a future sense all cultures that i've ever studied through my historical lens express desires to go beyond what was given a great example would be Egypt with its pyramids, <laughs> okay? Go back 3,000, no, 5,300 years and there were no pyramids, but there were people imagining something beyond themselves. To build pyramids, to build temples, to build the Gothic beautiful cathedrals that, you know, are across Europe and so on, takes imagination. And it also takes a sense that this can be done by us. And that yearning is to go beyond whatever it is. I see ultimately yearning is spiritual, but I see that it has many, many cultural, social, um, aesthetic expressions as well. We can talk more about that perhaps later. And I'll move on to the next slide. How am I doing for time? I'm on slide nine. Yeah, we can, the last few slides we can go quite quickly. So... One of, and a way to think about, especially the Ukrainian type situation at the moment, where you're under so much immediate pressure, it shuts down the ability to think about the future. You're so much in the present. 
especially if you're on, on you know in the, on the front um, in a as a soldier or whatever so we we have what's called the gravity of the presence it's like a pressure cooker that's the little picture there in the middle it says pressure cooker and you know we've got people people who want to keep us safe pulling one way people who want to change pulling the other way it's a bit like what Yaroslava said at the beginning, actually. She said, look, we've got, I'm looking over here because I took notes. You've got the high dream and the low dream. And most of what's happening ever is between those two points because we don't live in a black and white binary world. We live in a world where one day you might be feeling more low dream and the next day you might be feeling more high dream. So we, we move as human beings, as societies, communities, we move between those. That tug of war is really important. So then, this brings us to this concept that sits behind futures, is that the present is not set in stone, that we do have choices. The choices may seem thin on the ground when you're under the kind of pressure you are, but they're there. And a half of the time, the choice is something that begins internally. You have a choice to see a world beyond the invasion and the and the war, or you have a choice to surrender to that and stay living in that, what I would call soup. So futures thinking offers us a mix of anticipatory critique. Well, we've got to go to the next slide. I just realized that the next slide is not up yet. Yeah. So, you know, anticipatory critique is an important concept. Critique means not to be critical. It's to look at the power possibilities at work. Who wins and who loses by social, cultural, historical choices and events. Anticipatory critique says, okay, we might want to achieve freedom for Ukraine, but freedom for whom? What kind of society will you will emerge post this invasion? What kind of who will benefit by being at the top? Will the elites benefit? Will those who run you know major major companies be the real winners because they their technology was involved in the in the liberation war and so on? Will there be certain zones of Ukraine that might be first and then the second class citizens? You know these are these are thoughts that I would be thinking about because they that's the anticipatory, oh, I can see this might happen, this might happen, this might happen. And then you get 10, 20, 30, hundreds of people together to talk about what do we see post-war in the Ukraine. There was no vision, you know, in the Arab Spring revolutions, and they ended up with the same. They got rid of one elite, one oppressive regime, and they ended up with others. If you don't have a vision beyond that first horizon of, oh, we've got to get rid of the Russians, in your case, if you don't have a vision beyond that, you will end up with more of the same. So this is something that needs to be thought about. The goal is, obviously, when we start playing with alternatives, there's this alternative and that alternative, which one is the better alternative? And of course, we can imagine alternatives. And just like Yaroslava said with her high dream and low dream, something in between will emerge. That's important. But we can still think in terms of designing the future. Okay? If we start thinking, what do we want and what do we need to have in place for these futures to emerge? Surprises. You know, one of the key uh, statements on the future um, it comes from a guy from the 1960s, is that whatever we think of for it, for us to take a proposition or a proposal about the future seriously, it must at first seem to be ridiculous. Absolutely crazy. You're crazy. That's what it should feel like at first. But then you can say, well, what elements of that craziness can I see now emerging around us? And that's really important change to the next slide please this is the one where i'm looking at horizons and so on 
How do we make sense of what's around us? There's a lot of craziness around us, wherever we are, in whatever culture, whatever situation. It's not as or challenging necessarily as the craziness that you guys are facing in Ukraine. So the th we, looking at that image there, we've got three horizons. We've got a horizon that is now. Then we've got a horizon that is transformative. That's where a lot of turbulence occurs. That's where a different sets of crazy ideas get played out. And then there is a third horizon where a new Ukraine or a new future, or it might be a new Kiev, or what it doesn't have to be the Ukraine. It might be a new form of Europe, you know, um, or it might be totally new relationships between Ukraine and Russia, which can't even be imagined now. Okay, these are the sorts of things that the three horizons chart help us work with. And you can workshop those. I've workshopped them. They're a lot of fun. They can be quite challenging, especially when there are a lot of hot emotions in the room or quite di divergent worldviews playing out there. And so other possibilities of the emergent issues analysis or the futures triangle, where you look at the past, the present and the future on three axes. And, we, and essentially they are helping us these tools help us start to reflect on where we are now, where we might be, and how do we develop narratives, stories about how to get there, okay? It's not once upon a time sort of stories. These are stories that ultimately you would call scenarios, okay? Dana, the next slide, please. So scenarios are processes that help us generate stories where we can test the level of craziness as opposed to the level of reality. What is reality? Have you ever wondered, have you ever asked yourself, what is reality? Because that's, reality is kind of like a noose around your neck that will, that will hang you if you're not careful. So reality is purely what is happening around you at the moment. Our subjective appreciation of the world around us but it gets concretized in laws and social norms and so on. You know, truths that are not true. The world is flat or whatever it might be. You know, these, the, those truths which hold us in place, that capitalism is the best form, you know, it's much better than that socialism stuff or vice versa. If you're living in Cuba, you would have a very different take on that or mainland China, for instance. So we can see that realities are plural, just like futures are plural. And I would also say pasts are plural. There is no one past. For every individual, one of these screens that I can see on my computer at the moment, there is a human story that is unique. Okay? You may all be Ukrainian, but you're all unique and you're Ukrainian. I'm an Australian, Alan is an Australian, but we're unique, okay? And this is something that we need to start working with and we need to devise stories that are somehow slippery or flexible enough to generate inclusive possibilities from which we can start to explore healing, future possibilities through growing optimism and also start exploring real on the ground social processes like this one that Yaroslava, Victoria uh, uh, have been heading up. You know, these are things that we do to try and generate strong alternatives to a given present where you could all just be hanging your head around and saying it's all over, you know, by the shouting. So what I'm asking you to do, and this is the, the a new slide, is to start thinking about becoming imagination activists. I would suggest it's very likely that you already are imagination activists. So imagination is our human asset, but it's shackled to tradition. It's nailed down to context and habit. Oh, I can't do that. I can't imagine doing that. My husband would never cook dinner for me. Ha <laughs> ha, that sort of thing. <laughs> but maybe if you refuse to cook and you went on strike for a month, you know, your husband might start doing that. That's that, That's the sort of thing. So anticipatory imagination plays with this concept. We have we inhabit 
what this historian Yuri Harari, Yuval Harari, uh, has called imagined orders. And I think that's a really powerful idea for me. We imagine the world as it is, but it is only imagined. If you were to be transported over here to Australia, you would find a world that you would recognize, but would seem totally strange. Whenever I go to Europe or to South America, China, India, wherever I might end up, I'm walking around thinking, I recognize that, but gee, that there's something different about it. Sometimes you can see it and I can identify it clearly, but other times I can't. It's just a feeling. Of course, that's what, you know, when some of you, many of you are, are displaced to other parts of Europe, you're not in, in the Ukraine now, and it must be a bit like that for you. I mean, Poland is not that far from the Ukraine, for instance, that's where Victoria is, but Polish culture is not Ukrainian culture and vice versa, right? So we we have this kind of slippage that occurs there. So how do we reimagine the world around us? This is the kind of work that futurists or people working with futures thinking engage with. We're looking for optimal out outcomes and we're looking for pathways, which are real actions. This is not just imagining for fun. This is deadly serious. How do we imagine a world that we could make, that we could contribute to, so that as ancestors of the future, we become, um, we, we will be looked on, back on and appreciated for the kind of work that we do. So the second last slide is this one, the bird escaping from that cage again, where I began the talk. So we're not looking for answers, you know, but we are looking for insight. We have informed direction, which we will, we arrive at through the use of those tools, the kind of imagination activism I was talking about. We need to see the present, this thing, as reality, as remarkable. It's, it's not the same. Your present is not my present and vice versa. Optimism is an absolute treasure. We need to nurture it. We need to protect it. Okay? Optimism links to what makes life meaningful, especially in the face of crushing oppression and violence like what you're facing. One of the greatest tools that ultimately bring about change is optimism. I'm thinking Nelson Mandela and, you know, 30 years in jail in, in South Africa. What kept him alive? What kept them all alive? One was community. That jail was actually filled with very like-minded people. Um, so it was a bit of a mistake for the apartheid regime to stick them all in one place. But, you know, optimism is what kept them alive and ultimately brought about the end of apartheid in South Africa. That's probably simplistic in some respects, but that's really what it's all about. And finally, you know, what resources do we have to escape the cage? Well, there are a whole bunch of futures tools, but they're all the tools that you are all already using in your own practices that you're sharing and co-creating with Alan and Yaroslava and, and on your Saturday mornings or whenever it might be. It's really important. I end this little talk now, final slide, with three tools which you might find useful, um, linked to a long time project. It is in English. Um, but it, it is a beautiful exploration of thinking about being a uh, good ancestor. There's a book that I wrote some years ago with Richard Slaughter on futures thinking, which is filled with tools. And then there's my website, which you're welcome to come and visit. Um, you will note that at the base of all my slides I, is my email address. If anybody wants to contact me, and I might get 180 emails or something, but <laughs> or hundreds. But feel free to do so if you need something, if you want some clarity on one thing or another. I will uh, do my best to answer you. So I want to thank you for wading through that. It was what I call a a microdose. It was a microdose of the kind of stuff that I do. Hopefully, there's enough uh, thoughts there for you to start feeling. Curious, at least. And back to you, Alan, or is it Yaroslava? I'm not sure. 
Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Feel free to have a break for two seconds. We'll give you a transition time. <laughs> um, you've the interface between Marcus and myself as a, as a psychologist and a clinician. Um, there's one thing that I love the most, which is you talking about yearning, because my new development that I've been thinking about is every time I listen to the levels of distress and impact in the in the Saturday morning groups, I hear a lot of distress, a lot of impact, a lot of difficult information, and it's shared and understood. But, and <laughs> what we've looked at is to be able to hear the yearning in the distress. And that skill set is an incredibly good therapeutic because even in an altered state of upset and, and difficulty and impacts, all yearning still come through. And yeah. I think this is where you and I have a common language that we can work off. Otherwise, I'm scared if I do psychology and you do futures talking, we'll go in two separate directions. <laughs> but uh, my job now is to ask you questions. And where these questions come from, uh, they come from the very frontiers of what needs to happen in the Ukraine. It's an incredibly important element of these questions and the, the heart and spirit that they come from is uh, you, some of you will know and understand, but before I even go near the questions, I actually have to honor the context that these questions come from. I have to take a deep bow to the people's lives that are impacted so deeply and i have and i need to be of respect because even though this is questions done by two australians from a distance it actually is contextually an incredibly frontier type way of working and thinking and developing so to honor the context that they come from particularly honor the the input I've got from the soldiers and those at the front line and to honor even those, you know, cause we're talking to some of them now to honor and appreciate them and to honor the wives and family members that are desperate to understand that there's a context of hope, even though there's a lot of destruction, despair and, and just, you know, absolute uh, hopelessness in so many levels of, of, of existence. So with that, I just check in with Anastasia. Do you need, <laughs> do we need some time? Do, is it, Cause once we jump in asking these questions, uh, we're going to be incredibly absorbed by them. <laughs> so Let's, I'll, I'll wait for you, Anastasia, to give me a time. No, 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 I'm here. I, I, <laughs> no, that, 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 that's totally fine. I'm wondering if anyone, do we need to get the one minute break now or we don't get the minute break? And uh, sh yeah, what, what shall we do? Let us let's, let's, let's take care of you and do one minute break so we can do the transition. Shall we one do that? Minute. Yep. Yeah. Yep. One, one minute. So give, let's. Да, Настюша, відпочивай теж, тебе є хвилинка. Я зараз тут буду на зв'язку, якщо що. Ми розмістили послання зараз на заставочка, але ви можете бачити всі, хто в зумі, можете бачити мене. Всі, хто онлайн, можете тільки чути. Для тих, хто в зумі, ми розмістили посилання на прохання кількох учасників, посилання на гугу форму, тому що, можливо, ви отримали посилання напряму від наших партнерів. Тому є гугл форма, в яку ви можете перейти, заповнити свої дані і... Я впевнена, що запис буде, але ми ніколи не знаємо на 100%, на 90%, а на майбутнє. Наші альтернативні майбутнє, є майбутнє, де є запис, є майбутнє, де немає запису. 
Але якийсь запис точно буде, бо українська або англійська, а далі ми якось справимося. За цим посиланням ми відправимо додаткову інформацію разом з цим відео. Тобто ви можете зараз заповнити. Але якщо ви вже є в чаті Telegram, то ви, в принципі, це для вас зайва інформація. Тож, в чаті Telegram ми ще розмістимо пізніше всі посилання, які нам сьогодні пропонував і доктор Маркос Бюсі, і запропонує ще Алан Річардсон, а також наш проект Regeneration. Вікуля, ти щось хотіла сказати, так? Так, також розмістила наш ком'юніті, де проходять суботні зустрічі з Аланом, бо в чаті писали, ви бачите це, можете переходити, там теж буде інформація і ці суботні зустрічі, і ще інші зустрічі, які ми розробляємо, які відбуваються, ви все будете бачити в цій групі. Так, да, до речі, ці всі зустрічі якраз є пілотними проєктами, це, як знаєте, не пілот, це майданчик для супер перевірки. Да? Там ми розробляємо разом з вами дуже багато всього. По суботах ми бачимося з Аланом. По середах раз на місяць ми бачимо з Лейном Ар'є. Ще в нас є грецькі, грецькі спеціалісти. Вони так само підтримують нас. Далі в нас є представники з Японії. Ще в нас є Польща, Чехія, Америка. Іспанія. Але ці всі люди, в чому прикол? Я розумію ваше запитання, а більшість цих людей, вони взагалі то іноземці, як вони можуть нас зрозуміти, дуже читаю це питання одразу. Історія в тому, що ми їх знали до того, і вони якраз з третього дня війни, перші півроку, кожен день виходили в ефір, і вони дуже в контексті, абсолютно в контексті того, що відбувається, наскільки це можливо. Тому е, ми... Е, Ну, в принципі, гарантуємо, що ці люди вас зрозуміють, але якщо не зрозуміють, мають достатньо сили і мудрості почути вас, щоб спробувати зрозуміти. Я бачу, що повернулася вже Анастасія. Ми можемо, я буду відключатися. Там хтось написав Йорнінг, це прагнення, прагнення. Так, да, там було запитання. Прагнення, це бажання, стремління до чогось, що, можливо, з контактом з чим би е, втратили. Отже, е, технічна підтримка Костя, переключаємо вже знову на Алана та Маркуса, а я завершую свою розмову. Окей, okay, we're back. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Okay, so these questions are... As I, I've shared them with you previously, so there's no surprises. But I have to say these questions have a, have a contextual statement that comes from them. So the first question is, if we deal with the futures and futures thinking, then there's a question around history. And there's, there's a question here that says, why doesn't Ukrainians learn from the past? Of Alan, all Alan, the times in history. Alan, can you hear me? Just one minute. Can you say you in Ukrainian translation channel? Yes, Alan. you are in Ukrainian. Alan, Alan. Tell me something more. Tell, tell me something more. Кажу, кажу, кажу. Я тут, я тут, я тут. Ти тут. Я чую два рази. Чудово, чудово. Я себе наушник чую другий раз. Tell me something more. Кажу, кажу, кажу. Я тут, я тут, я тут. Ти тут. Я чую два рази. Чудово, чудово. Я себе наушник чую другий раз. Так, два рази зараз. Техніка, техніка. Технікал іщу. I can hear the issue. It says the interpretation is off. Виключено має бути в тебе або включено, або в когось. Може, хтось включився, в мене немає, і я виключена. Зараз пройдемо. Виключено має бути в тебе або включено, або в когось, може, хтось включився. Це у Маркуса. Ага, на секундочку, Маркус виключив. Ага, чудово. Але так не має бути. А ну, Настю, що скажи ще раз. Український канал. Зараз я в українському каналі, все є, але я себе не чую. Але у Маркуса і у Алана виключені зараз мікрофони. А що сталося? Нічого не помінялося. Все те саме, ті самі навушники, все так само. Все є, все те саме. А ну, давайте ще раз спробуємо. Let's try again. Alan, just checking. Checking. А давайте зараз ще разочку звук спробуємо. Так, я себе чую. А тепер ще давайте Маркуса. Анастазія, ти правий? 
Marcus, can you hear me? Can you unmute and we check the sound? Marcus. Yeah, right. is that okay? Yeah, good. Marcus, can you hear me? Can yes. you unmute and we check the Marcus. sound? Something is happening a... with the sound because something uh, from Marcus. Um, Questia, can you hear that sound? It's from Marcus, I think. Close the window, suffocate. <laughs> it's a future, it's a future. <laughs> <laughs> or it's past we are in few we are in present uh, how to say we are in okay. um we are in present uh, how to say we are in yeah i am not sure when the audio to idea the dwayne idea maybe you have, the, uh, you have one uh, translation only yours translation that yes only yours translation you have only English, so you don't have any kind of other gadgets joined to the no, only not. computer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, original. Okay, Anastasia, try uh, uh, one more. Try one more time. Tell something. Uh, do we hear anything from Marcus except the silence? <laughs> no, I think it's okay now. Yes, uh, Marcus, uh, uh, can you tell some? Just can you say one word, hello, or something like that? Hello. Look at this. I've got a wonderful thing here. Look. Oh. So we can look at that while uh, Anastasia is working things out. You've got until we get to the bottom for you to fix the problem, Anastasia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Oh. Let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, I use English. Uh, it works. Okay. It works. Let's. It works great. Thank you. So the first, the first question is in terms of thinking about the futures. Then, what do you do with this incredibly difficult past history that times for Ukrainians yeah. where as as this question goes there's a level of betrayal across time the the political memorandums the agreements the treaties the all the documents that were created and to this time turn out to be useless oh, and the oh, Buddha and the, and the Buddha and the Buddha yeah. Yeah, we've got a little bit of a there, but it's okay. Again, it's Sierra's it's 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 love. Yeah, it's me, but I switched off and I heard Anastasia again from Marcus. Maybe we can do like that when uh, Alan is talking, Marcus switch off, and uh, after that, we'll change. Okay. Okay. Like okay. That. So you'll have just two minutes because what we're looking at is the recent history of the Ukraine and the particular the documentation the intent which was to support a history within the for the Ukrainians and all of this seems to be currently none of it works well the disarmaments the agreements the memorandums and all the international agreements that were that developed over the last 40 years has not been ratified, achieved, understood, acted upon. So, Marcus, the question is, is if you look at the history and how things don't operate, things from the past can't be brought forward, aren't current, are difficult to maintain, what do you do when the history drags us into the present and the present gets laboriously difficult because of that past. That's, I mean, it's such a huge question. The issue we face with the past is that our history is so often the history of elite. For a start, you know the um, it's not the history of the common person on the street, but the common person on the street is often subject to. The... Sorry, 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 sorry. 
something wrong with your translation, Marcus. Is it okay for you to uh, just um, leave the conference and then to come back and I make you co-host again and we just need to reload something? Uh, because... Me leave or everybody else leave? <laughs> Who's leaving? <laughs> only you, only you, and then come back. Because I can see that uh, when you are talking, we can hear Ukrainian translation. It's impossible, but it's happening. I really, it's like a miracle, something like a miracle, but I can't explain it. So maybe a technical uh, way out would be like, you just leave, then come back. I will join you again and make you co-host and you can talk again. Is it okay, okay for you? Mm -hmm. That's fine. If I don't come back, I've been kidnapped. No, by... you will. <laughs> no, there might be aliens up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Please come back. I will find okay. you definitely. Okay, just a minute. Uh, just leave and then in a minute come back. Okay. So we've we've had double Marcus. Whatever's happening, we're supposed to have two of him and yeah. and and more than ever. So um this is where reality intrudes upon technology and for some reason, um, you know, his presence is supposed to be bigger, double the presence than what would be expected. It's now he's so loud that we have to sort of recalibrate him. Or so, we need to hear more Ukrainian language in Australia because this Ukrainian language is in Australia you know, <laughs> from Marcus. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's Marcus, true. Marcus, he's here. Marcus, are you here? Okay, I'm. Uh, I'm doing. You um, now. You are co-host, and uh, please switch on your phone. I just did. Yeah, you are here. Anastasia, try to tell something in Ukrainian channel. Okay. It's silent. I think it's silent. Let's wait for a second, and we will have the future in the. <laughs> in the past <laughs> yeah, there we go future perfect in the past <laughs> i think something like that okay let's try again uh, question Thank you. let's have to he's already asked his question he doesn't need to restate it does he i can respond to that now yes we can please say it again no. okay i mean the as i was saying when we start looking at history, history tends to be the history of elites negotiating with one another. Okay? Oh, I'm still hearing it. But... Maybe you can uh, choose the language, just check the language translation. Check the maybe, language. I should, maybe I should do it in Ukrainian. <laughs> yeah. Can you choose the original? Okay. What, does that work uh, now? Yeah. Okay. Let's try again. Original sound. This is so important question because we are staying on this question, still on this answer. <laughs> original sound you have. Okay. Let's try. So. Uh, nothing's happening yet. Good. Um, yeah, so for me, the, the question of the burden of history is uh, a, a really important moral, uh, ethical question. It's also a question of how do we make meaning? So history has traditionally been a, you know, an elite uh, uh, People wrote histories of their, their country, France, Germany, or whatever it might be, or they wrote stories about the elites, the kings, the queens, the pharaohs, and, and whatever. So given that that's been the case, we, we have a, a bad sense of the relationship between social process and the impact of those processes on one. Uh, no, no, stop, stop again. I am I'm I really don't know what is happening. Kostya, can you just come back to the... Uh, to the... Something. Let's try to do something. Uh, Kostya, are you here? Kostya, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Kostya, let's go. 
Right. So going back to Alan's question about history, it's quite reasonable to feel betrayed by our past. Okay. And I think it's reasonable okay. because there's a lot of evidence that the agreements that we've made at various times have failed. Or they've been only passed. Uh, okay, so as I was saying before, we tend to see history as the history of events. Events, let, let's say, like treaties that are agreed to by different protagonists, you could call them, different uh, parties. Uh, but those treaties are treaties between elites, between elites, usually to solve a very, um, what would I call it, a very present-centered problem. They're not thinking long-term. The, uh, the very famous one is 1648, the Truth Treaty of Westphalia, which basically created the nation state. They created the nation state because they wanted to stop the wars then. And they wanted to be able to do whatever they liked in their own nation state. So all the elites were controlling these nation states. They weren't worried about the number of people that were dying. They just need, They just knew that war was bad for business. And they created nation states. Now, the problem we have today is that nation states don't function like they did 300 years ago. Nation states function differently, and they're in a totally different economic, political, and also philosophical worldview, media-saturated environment. And yet, the war between Russia and Ukraine is a war between nation states. And those nation states, the other nation states around, are working out what they do, but always in their own interests. Nation states privilege the interests of the elites within that nation state. The elites in Russia, the elites in Ukraine, the elites in the US, France, Poland, wherever. Um, and we tend to confuse that with history. Because history is, you know, our memory of the past and how we make sense of the past and, and how it plays out in the present. Yes, it is, but it's also much, much more than that. History, and I've, I've made the point before, Yaroslav talked about process-oriented, uh, was it therapy, I think, was the term? Okay, so history is about process. Human beings, we live with process all the time. The process of getting this um, port to work so that we didn't have all that confusion. It, it's a process and we have to work it out and solve the problem at the levels we're working at. History works at the level of the family, the community the family's in, the e ecological world around that family, which is part of a city maybe, or maybe it's a, you know out in the country. You know, there's... So we need to mess with our concept of history for a start, but to also understand that the nation state is a form of individualism, which sees I'm English, I'm German, I'm Ukraine, I'm Russian, and so on. And it makes it look like there's a legal identity that says you're an, an Italian, you're a you know, Greek, wherever. So we need to understand that this kind of individualism, which is part of the nation state formula for managing complex relationships, is failing. It's been failing for a long time. It was failing from the beginning of the 19th century, the end of the 18th century, actually. But, and, you know, we, we tend to think that the Enlightenment, which was this wonderful philosophical period, where you know people came up with great ideas and, and became rational, that we become rational. Alan, are human beings rational people first, or are we something else first? What would you say? No. As we we try hard to be rational, but in that trying, we act purely on emotion. I would say that's correct. 
that we are um, emotional beings and we use reason, which is a kind of set of rules, to rationalize our emotions. <laughs> so you, I'm a nationalist or, uh, you know, I'm, you know, uh, I'm proud to be this or that. Or I really feel a rage against those Russians or uh, Israelis with the Palestinians, you know, where they and immediately they dehumanize the op the opposition, because our emotions suddenly see the opposition outside of our own emotional bubble. So we've got a bunch of stuff happening there, and to me, my deep love of history is a deep love of inquiring into how have human beings solved problems and also, of course, how have we unintentionally created new problems? So we create a treaty to solve this problem, the Treaty of Versailles, you know, solved the problem between, you know, the warring parties of the First World War and it created all the conditions, economic and so on, that led to the Second World War. So this is the sort of thing that we're dealing with. I, I I could go on, but I will stop and let Alan go on with his questions. No, no, it's 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 beautiful. But if I reduce myself down to a psychologist, I'd be going, okay, when how does an individual in their aspirations, dreaming, process, yearning, all of that, how can an individual make a difference? given oh. some of some of the reflection some of the resistance is repressive of individualism and will only pick up once there's a dominance of force and reason and rationality and mm. power how does the how does the individual become powerful i my gut reaction to that alan is that the individual is powerful but the way that we understand individualism is we have a very brittle, anorexic, thin layer of understanding of individuality. I think individuals are beings who authentically engage with themselves, but understand themselves as part of ongoing co-creative community, ecological, all those processes expand the individual in a way. So that means that every one of us on this um, Zoom session here, all our minds are flowing in a way. And out of that arises culture, but also out of that arises something. And this is the stuff that I often want to call mystery, because I think you can't put your finger on it in any truly concrete way. But the shifts and flows that we feel and experience in culture those moments of elation, you know, when you and I were standing around watching this on TV or something, Alan, in 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down. You know, there is something like that, and you can feel a rise in the collective optimism, the collective excitement, and so on. So the individual stands not as an isolated individual, but as a an individual within the context, history, time, place, person, family, everything that's going on around them and contributes often unconsciously to the expansion of the next moment, you know, that, that moving into the next moment, which is led by yearning. You know, if we, we yearn for mm. security, but we also yearn for freedom. We often sacrifice freedom for security, for instance. Victoria has raised her hand. Was that because you want to ask a question? It's okay, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. Oh, you were just practicing. Okay. Everybody raise their hand. Let's see how many people can raise their hands all at once. That was an invitation, actually. No. But anyway. <laughs> Look, oh, there it comes. A few are coming through. So, yeah, for me, I think this, this question of the individual has been subverted by capitalism, by certain forms of philosophy that have isolated the individual, this sort of existential angst stuff that we have. I'm not denying it th that it doesn't exist, but it exists in contexts that I think are, we're being forced to reframe everything. This is going to be a century of reframing, not just of what does it nationalities and nation states mean, but what does it also mean 
to have a relationship with the with the environment how do we exist as human beings i think this is and the pain is immense the pain is immense and for me the kind of work that i try to do is try to open little spaces where people can feel some sense of meaning and purpose because some of those questions you you got on your list alan are about meaning and purpose what does it mean to be an individual how do i engage my voice to generate optimism how do i deal with memories of the past there's the immediate past you know trauma is of course to do with the immediate past and being locked in those cycles um but there's also the deeper past you know what does it mean really what does it mean to be a ukraine you know are there uh, are there ways that, you know, you could walk down the street, not mention a word, so you're not hearing somebody speak Ukrainian. Can you spot a Ukrainian if you're on, on a street in New York or London or somewhere? Oh, that person's got to be, you know. Um, and we're not, we can't give it to, they've got different colour skin or different facial features and so on. What does it mean? And to me, these are kind of perplexing questions, but they're good questions to ask. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go from the, the the individual and the traction from an individual to the extreme, which is around technology. That um, Elon Musk put a huge emphasis on providing Starlink receivers so that the three satellites that sit above the Ukraine can be well picked up and to the point where Yaroslava being in the subway in the middle of that first three or four weeks was was incredibly capable amongst all the bombings of the the electrical spot we still had groups where people were in many places with their phones and their batteries so the technology that allows us to come together is now extreme so does that technology create an ease of access to developing a future collectively or what 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 tell us about technology feel free oh technology we create technology then technology creates us right i mean it's 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 kind of that sort of thing i was having a conversation with my sister the other day who's a very good academic um and she's looking at uh for her university actually she's researching the impact of ai artificial intelligence chat gbt all that kind of stuff on the process but we started talking about hammers you know what did a hammer do what's the metaphor of a hammer hammer is a technology too hammer enabled you know people uh like those egyptians who were knocking out the the pyramids they just used pieces of rock with stick to cut out the uh the the blocks so because they were it wasn't even an iron age they, they were still basically neolithic so technology does something really important it enables human beings to do what they couldn't do before but what they had already yearned for i think yearning is part of what is at work here we yearn for community we yearn for connection and technology now enables us to do that if we go back 50 years we had lines of you know for telephone so we'd pick up the telephone no one does that anymore probably don't people don't you know under 40 don't even know what that means <laughs> go like that oh that's a telephone but you know telephones aren't like that anymore you can't because we're all wireless go back another 100 years and you've got telegraph and you've got other forms of communication the Romans built the roads of the Roman roads that still tie Europe together in many respects so that they could communicate. So if we start thinking about the power of technology, it extends what we can imagine. But once it's there, suddenly we start imagining other things. Got the mobile phone. Wow, that's really great, isn't it? It's the most up, it, the, the uptake of the mobile phone was the most, um, was the was the fastest technology ever adopted on a global level okay um and yet people thought oh i can use this to blow up the twin towers 
we can coordinate our actions to bring down the Twin Towers, which they did. Then I talked about the Arab Spring. They use these very skillfully to organize and get around security, oppressive security um, processes that were in place to keep the citizens under control. Citizens are the most dangerous people to a government, to their own government, because you know we can we can bring about the change of that government, and you know unless they've got lots of guns. So you do have a Tiananmen Square type situation sometimes, where citizens are, are gunned down, but it leaves a scar and a memory in the mind too. Technology therefore generates and extends the human capacity, I think, to yearn. We yearn to be connected. Elon Musk, with his Skylink, is very skillful at picking up on some of that, but he's also growing it the way he shapes other technologies, like Twitter becomes X, you know, which is, I think, a rather dubious shift, even though it was great that he put the Skylink satellite to both your Ukrainian, you know, as a, at, at that time. Does that go some way to <laughs> responding to you, Alan? <laughs> it, it, it does, because it totally does. I, we all benefit from it, you and I particularly in this moment, and uh, to have us all together is impressive. So we're, we're going to the other side is that for the, for the, the, the soldiers in the front line, there's a bunch of questions that are incredibly important. And they need to tell you that for them, the future is an illusion. Once they get to the front line, once they get to battle, their focus is on the here and now and survival. Yeah. That continues until the day they get to withdraw from the front line and that focus on here and now and the lostness around the future pervades. So mm. there's a question around the loss of the future. Yeah. War destroys people's sense of future. It's the trauma, the fear takes it away. So how do warriors and heroes, you know, come together to create a future beyond just the impacts of their individual lives? Mm. I think that there are multiple levels that are at work there. I mean, I'm, and, and when I'm saying that, I mean really multiple levels. I think at the individual level, uh, trauma is, is unique. I mean, you can't say his trauma and her trauma are the same. So, and as therapists and psychologists, you would know that way better than me. But the trauma gets locked in the body, actually almost at a cellular level. And, you know, I've had a lot of interest for a long time in embodied work, somatic work, whatever you want to call it, okay? And I know it's got different uh, titles. And that somatic work is one way that you begin to perhaps engage with some of those, the, the, the trauma that cuts you off from the sense of being in time, you know? And that sense of being in time is, is the gift of being human. So trauma diminishes that gift of being human. And yet, I have, in my own limited experience, particularly more with young people, actually, with children who've been traumatized at school, uh, come to understand that play, body movement, and all sorts of modalities like that kick in. And they they go some way to dealing with that at that at that physical level of trauma. At the cultural, social level of trauma, I think what we deal with is what kind of narratives are associated with the warrior. What kind of narratives that are realistic? Because it's one of the things that we've seen uh, a lot, let's say, in Australia, particularly in the 20th century, was uh, the soldiers who returned from the First and Second World War 
Korean War, the, the Vietnamese War, these wars, they all came back and there were virtually no societal constructs other than this mythic sense of the mythic warrior. But a mythic warrior actually doesn't help the individual. How do we, how might that warrior take aspects of that warrior culture into relative, relevant, sorry, social processes? So that then the warrior story itself gets maybe reduced down to a more realistic level, but also actioned. I think all of us need to feel that we have a purpose. If you've been a warrior and suddenly you're not a warrior, well, what are you, a farmer or a postman? <laughs> you know, yeah. you've got to have some place to go. And that place needs to be affirming. So the way you would employ your warriors, depending on who, whether they've got arms and legs still or, you know, all sorts of issues come into play, where the society themselves finds ways to honour the, the warrior, but at the same time, allow the warrior to become and, and, and grow into a new identity where the warrior is part of who they are, but they can also be a happy postman or, you know, work in an office or perhaps take do something, you know, like being in a police force or something where some of that identity is still held on to and inferred. I don't know, Alan, I'm, but those no, layers yeah. are really, really important. Well, you, you got to the point of saying that once they're warriors and then they come from the front line, they at times become nobody. They're no longer a warrior. They're no longer invested in being anything. And they have difficulty in their what's normal is now a incredibly, you know, shallow reality. So they're not anybody. So you, I asked you this question before, and you gave me an answer about how the individual warriorhood is supported somehow. Yeah. And you know, I, you know, my colleagues and I will have some ideas, but also that there is a respect and regard for family and culture and and the nation. Yeah. which often gets lost in their dysfunction of their return. You know, the, the the classic story is where a soldier comes home from the weekend, he sits down and looks out the window uh, for days. He spends his time just looking out the window and his wife at some point gets incredibly upset that he's wasting the day, he's wasting his time just simply staring out the window. Now, that's an example of that warriorhood that tries to keep going somehow and how it gets lost in the, the, the sort of shallowness of normality. So how to pervade the warriorhoodness and how to, if you're looking at the mythic warrior, how to support a development past that point To me, it comes down to context. Um, so context is the here and now. Where is the warrior? Has has he or she returned to a you know a uh, an urban life, a rural life? What were they before the warrior? What and and how might those aspects of before be reconnected? Because it's almost certain that there's there's a break between. They were a, uh, an accountant or they were working on in IT or whatever it might be. And suddenly they're out on the front line having to deal with front line issues. And, and that break leads to a deep discontinuity. And I think that uh, I'm being asked if I speak Russian. Sorry, I just popped up here. Um, so that the, the discontinuity is something we need to deal with. One of the things from my uh, futures and history sort of space is that continuities and discontinuities kind of overlap, that we, we have this kind of dialogue between um, forms of identity, because this is really what we're on about here, is the identity of the returned service person. And that identity is you know, obviously under stress. From a futures perspective, I would 
say working with community in community working as, and I, I will go back to the body because i really have seen the most remarkable things occur with body movement whether it's dance whether it's uh, um, taking forms whether it's also micro movements just like the hand how many ways can you move a hand can you move it so it looks like anger or joking you know those sorts of things finding ways to link back to biophysical roots which have been traumatized by you know being a near miss or you know also having caused harm to others just as much as this trauma so i would i would have to be sitting there with the people for for me and i also trust i really trust intuition as you know, as a futurist, as an educator, as a historian, when I'm with people in a context, you let the magic happen. You let something into the room that you can't put your finger on. And I know that sounds a bit airy fairy and not very scientific, I might add, at one level, but there is something happens when we bring people together. Healing comes out of community as much as it comes out of anything that happens in here in my own head. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, you get asked elaborate questions and we get elaborate answers. It's very beautiful. So we, we're going to change a little bit and we're going to talk about the next generation mm -hmm. and the teenagers that are growing up, even though that's trying to be normalized as best as possible in the Ukraine, they have a life that contextually they were supposed to grow up and become independent and free to some extent. And they have a life now where growing up and freedom is no longer, freedom got taken away. Things, uh, the, the adults are under pressure, to, you know, struggling hard in all their developments. They, even they struggle hard as parents to try and achieve it even moving out of ukraine again adds another layer of a struggle mm -hmm. and and yep. fragmentation so all of these things go your next generation's future just got decimated it got destroyed in that moment and instead of growing up and being independent in the world there's no motivation at all for that. It's 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 already depressive. So how do you deal with the the sort of teaching down to the next the younger generation that is smart enough to see everything and is lost enough not to know what to do? Mm. I guess for me it it comes down to that question or that point that you made, Alan, about seeing everything. Are they smart enough to see everything? Because when your context is reduced, your everything becomes um, both fragile but also thin. You know, and that that um, that means that what we need to to do and to work on is rebuilding agency, rebuilding capacity within young people. And that can be involving them in idealistic youthful projects that are, you know, let's say like uh, it could be rebuilding a car uh, to help with somebody down the road, or it could be working in, you know, uh, with soil and the earth um, stuff that I've worked a lot with adolescents and the kind of stuff that really turns them on is where they do a bunch of stuff with their hands and then they get to dream about it with their, you know, in, around a, you know, a campfire at night or whatever it might be that they, they actually need the, the physical stuff. Young people, let's say 14, 15 or so, they are so in their body, they really need to do things with that body and it's one of the reasons why they struggle so much in conventional schooling at that age um so for me i would be doing stuff with them 
and making them making these things spectacles too. Uh, and and uh, if we had more time, I I can tell you stories from my own experience. But you know, there's so much that young people could be doing to rebuild the their own self esteem and their social social infrastructure. Could be helping old lady down the road, you know, milk her goat. <laughs> I don't know what ha what people do, you know, old ladies do in the Ukraine. But you know, I have a kind of fanciful idea from all my lovely. Ukrainian illustrations and books. I love the beautiful. That art from the Ukraine is fabulous. And that's where, where my imagination goes when I start filling in the blanks, Alan. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So you, you talk a lot about the creativity and a lot of the creativity comes out of fracturedness. And, and at times, creativity and imagining and uh, you know, trying to see a sense of hope and potential is difficult to do. So when people have had to leave Ukraine and have worked hard to establish themselves in another country, they fundamentally get torn between two worlds. Yeah. And it's hard to go back because Ukraine may never be the same or their experiences are too difficult, or on the other hand, they've adjusted to their new country and they never thought it, but the new country becomes a home. What do you do with that torn, uh, you know, dreaming that can't happen, that torn identity? It, it gets misplaced and gets lost. What do you, what do, you do with that fracturedness? How does the future come out of fracturedness? Through the kind of, I mean, there are no, uh, one thing I want to say to everybody actually is what I'm providing uh, aspects of a response to Alan's questions. I'm not giving him answers, answers, because I don't believe in answers. I believe in good questions that then lead us to explore what might we do with fractured um, social and um, national identities of people who are no longer in their, in their uh, where they thought they would be as old people and suddenly they're somewhere else and that sort of thing. So their stories have been broken. And yet there is much there, the creative much there, that I would say is how do they reintegrate stories with their new context? What they have is, is they have a story of dislocation. Can that story of dislocation be transformed? Can it become transformative? Um, in that sense, of course, the creativity comes from their ability to accept where they are at now honor where they were and dream about where they might be and this is where again community is so important this is where also the kinds of tools that you guys are skilled in for instance and different sorts which are sort of futures tools as well where those stories become part of their future in a proactive way a very simple thing a timeline Let's draw up the timeline. Let's put a timeline uh, starting with COVID. Okay, we'll kick off with COVID. That was pretty disruptive. What was happening then? Who were the significant figures in that? Then there was a dislocation when the timeline went that way because the Russians invaded. And then your family went that way. So you create a timeline, for instance, which suddenly enables the people who are timelining, turn that into a verb, uh, to start to tell their story in a way where they can actually see that because the, the timeline keeps going right even though i you know there are problems with timelines that it keeps going so it immediately sets up the thing of let's then take the timeline oh here we are what is it the 9th of march 2024 let's push the timeline further out to the 9th of march 2030 where might we be where would you like to be where where is your yearning calling you and then back, work our way back. This is a traditional thing that we do in futures, work our way back, back casting, to where we are again now, to say, okay, 
I need to do that. But one of the other things I want to do is make sure that my son or daughter gets an education in the new country so that they become uh, culturally competent in that country so that then they can achieve goals, the same sort of goals that you might have had. In a sense, you're a lost generation. You might have been at your last year of law school at university in Kiev, and suddenly you're in another country where the laws of Ukraine don't matter <laughs> because you're in another country. And so, you, you know, there's going to be some loss of story there. And then you have to work out how to fill those spaces in. And I would say you fill them in narratively so that you've got, um, so that you can actually start seeing in context the bigger picture of which you're a part. So it's no longer just a story of loss and dislocation, but loss and dislocation becomes something that transforms and takes you somewhere else. Yes. I, I was just thinking Australians are good at dislocation and loss. Mm. Given that we've only been here, you know, 200 years, we, you know, the European history is one of dislocation. So I, 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 I feel that. So we've got one last question, which is about when there's so much conflict and destruction outside in your world, it also has an internal reflection between inside yourself and with the people around you. There tends to be a, a, a level of fragmentation, dissatisfaction, frustration, difficulties, and the threshold mounts. How does, how does someone overwhelmed by the external and the internal be able to create some traction to move ahead? and some motivation to uh, develop something besides their survival. Mm. Look, some of, we, in a sense, we've kind of skirted around that question because what we've got, we've got individuals who often feel because of the pressure of their context, they feel isolated. So that, that, isolated individualism which is something that's you know quite dominant in western culture today anyway promoted economically and so on but it also comes down to isolation in the psychic sense mm -hmm. and for me so much of the thinking that goes on in futures but and in history is about challenging that sense of separation uh, and, you know, so we're talking, at one level, I think you would approach your question perhaps therapeutically, psychologically, but I would also say that we can approach it through the broader cultural tools available to us that look at, that, uh, that there's a strong emergence, there's a shift occurring in, I would say, the way we understand the world as, as a species. That shift is coming out in multiple ways through podcasts, books, movies, films, so many things. And that it's pointing towards a reintegration of the individual with greater levels of meaning and community. And that community is not just you and us all hanging out. That's This is really important, but it's also being able to go into a forest or to walk down a street and feel the ages and the cultures, the people in the to walk with your ancestors, but knowing that you're an ancestor walking into the future. This is something that I think is really it's it's really exciting, but it's also incredibly disorienting. You know the 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 fact that we are recapitulating what happened in the twenty first twentieth century in this century through violence and war, uh, rising racism and, you know, and genocidal activities and so on. The fact that we're doing that at the same time as dreaming other stuff is paradoxical, but it's also suggesting that something really important is happening. And again, I will come back to what I said at the very beginning, and that's something important we cannot understand. We don't see how we fit in. But so for me, one of the one of the sources of optimism 
is the sense that we're, we're part of things that are greater than us and that what's happening in the Ukraine is uh, symptomatic of that struggle, but it's also creating new amazing human beings who have who are forced right at the cutting edge of this to be doing the rethinking and the restoring and the reenacting of all that rubbish that's behind us in history in the hope that maybe we will be good ancestors. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I, If you would like, what's the... I know you've given so many messages and so much of yourself and so much of your knowledge and wisdom and skill. What's the main gift you want to do on as we finish off? Is there a main gift at all? That there are alternatives to the dominant story that you're living. There are other ways out. You know, and yes. that's and that we have the cultural, we have the cultural capital, we have the social capital, we have the intellectual capital to actually build new futures, um, even in the worst context. Yes, thank you. You see, uh, there's a bunch of people I'd love to invite into a Ukrainian support group, and you've just got your way in. You've got your ticket in. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you're you're in. You, I'm sure if we, I'm sure that um, if we give you another invitation at some point, the answer will be yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I think I what know. you guys are doing is so important, and you know, my heart's with you. Yeah, that was from the very first day that the Russians crossed your border. I thought, oh, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's good. So thank you very much, Marcus. Um, it's it's so muchly appreciated, and your capacity to answer some of the most difficult questions. And if I added the psychological edge to it, it was to see how the interface between psychology and people's aspiration gets traction with a greater force beyond their own individual force and a social capacity to build it into the future. So thank you for that gift. I um, I had to go looking for you, but I'm glad I found you. Well, I'm glad you found me too, because it's, this is a, um, it, I mean, it's just, it, it's core. The reason why I've been doing what I've done all my life is to help and to, also, I learned about myself, and I don't like answers. So I responded to your questions, Alan, but I don't like answers because answers are like you know chopping the head off a chalk or something. I mean, it, it, it's over. Whereas we're not. There's we are in a process. Yaroslava, you spoke about process at the beginning. We are in processes and processes, and they're you know all these different levels from the most banal through to the most profound. Okay. So Anastasia, when you cut the head off a chook, it's a chicken. Okay. <laughs> so it's a very Australian thing to say, but I have yep. to translate to get it translated with, with, with properly. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank a whole lot of people that have helped. One of them is Anastasia and... Usually, I'm a great beneficiary of her translating, and she connects me to you all. And at the beginning of this year, I think I had a panic attack when I thought Anastasia would uh, somehow disappear or get sapped up by the BBC. And uh, I told her I had a panic attack because she's the only person in my life I rely on. And she got quite confused by that. But once again, we're relying on you to bridge the gap between, in this case, true Australianisms and uh, you all in the Ukraine who, you know, I love and appreciate dearly. So thank you, Anastasia, Yaroslav, Yaroslava, Victoria, the people from the weekly groups that are there building 
together. I know so much has already been built and I, I don't have many places in my world where the enthusiasm, the spirit to change is so evident that's with you all. So, so I so appreciate you all. And uh, I said to Marcus that, you know, meeting this group, you can't expect, you won't be able to expect, uh, you know, and I said, I said, don't expect a traumatized bunch of people that are quiet. Expect people that have got a zest for life and a real appetite to make change beyond purely surviving. And uh, so that's been important. Um, this isn't going to stop. And I'll give you a taste of the next step that we're going to do together. The taste is all about um, putting together the reclaiming project. And up to now, we've done two years of support group. Up to now, we've done the regeneration project for civilians and facilitated in groups. Then in October, with the help of Yaroslav, who's on screen as I speak, we're looking at the, the reclaiming for soldiers in their return home. Because that return is incredibly predictable what they're going, what's on board. You know, as as people come back, you have the issues that need to be reclaimed for soldiers in their journey. And part of it is uh, the, the aspects of there's collective impacts. As a nation, at least you've shared the shock, the overwhelm, the despair. And on top of that, that collective impact oh, is... <laughs> Wait for the screen to catch up with me. You got to go all the way through. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's some graphics that go with what I'm saying, and it's easier to for you to see it in Ukrainian. But the the important thing about reclaim is, I've actually developed it as a form of therapy, and what distinguishes the therapy is the notion that the yearning that comes from distress is the one thing that you can hold on to and grow and develop, and it will be the therapeutic exit from, from actually being crushed by the moment. So therefore, that reclaiming as a, as a form of therapy is what we're going to do and teach. The next thing that we're doing is to see that as a nation, the collective impacts normally under most Western sort of psychotherapeutic psychology models, that the collective impact ends in an individual in isolation dealings with their own individual feeling. And for me, that's no longer a reality that should be anticipated. For me, what's important is that as a civilian culture that the one person's therapy get shared to become more of you that in a group where one person does a piece of therapeutic work, it becomes vicarious that all people benefit. So that notion of collective impact and collective healing is incredibly important. Otherwise we're just fueling the pharmacology of, you know, sedation and the anxiety medication and the antidepressant medication. None of that should be a part of the evolution of Ukraine as a nation out of this. So the other one is I know you all that most people would avoid seeking individual help when there's so many suffering equally. So what we're looking at is where the collective strength to actually contribute to each other's well-being is the impetus to make the change and create a civilian groundswell of support. And particularly with soldiers and those that have, you know, injuries post-war and post, you know, their return from the front, they themselves are an incredibly important and insightful, wise, important people to actually get involved in the healing process. They themselves are their own heroes. They themselves still have much to offer. 
they themselves need to be located in your future. So that's important. As you can tell, it's important to me. The last thing we're going to do is as a team of us will be presenting the whole notion of reclaiming therapy internationally around the world because there's some cutting edge therapeutic approaches that streamline therapy not as an individual journey but it streamlines therapy as 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 i said a, a collective healing and that we're going to do and present from you know all aspects of the world and and uh, get the rest of the world to understand what we're doing as well as training as many people as possible. So that's the direction we're going in. At some point, you'll see how presenting in this front again and again. And the Saturday groups are all about developing the elements of themes that are important for you all as a healing journey and it's developing. So thank you all for your participation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the continuing evolution and the continuing journey. And nobody's going to stop, including me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan, for the conclusions. <laughs> because I understood that uh, in the mass of, of all the events uh, today, during this broadcasting, I just understood that I got a lot of information and uh, uh, at the same time now I from you and from Marcus at the end I got like uh, how to say it's like conclusions insights as you Marcus mentioned not uh, in, not the answers but insights and I hope uh, that and one of the insights was Ukrainian language from Brisbane <laughs> so it was like a new insight that we need to go <laughs> to Australia to meet with you, oh. maybe all of us, 163 persons who were listening to Ukrainian language broadcasting from Brisbane. <laughs> it's something like incredible. And I'm so thankful for this small miracle because yeah. of the technical problems, but we got that miracle. And maybe this is like mm. a, one of the futures, Ukrainians, Australians, together doing something i think i got the your message marcus <laughs> so i want to thank you for your time for your for your professionalism and uh, for your heart especially because you both alan and marcus became somehow i can say that you are friends now professional definitely friends <laughs> and uh, thank you really thank you both of you for this meeting and for your patience uh, because of all the obstacles, but they appear to be a um, gift <laughs> at the end. And uh, thank you, Alan, for your idea, for your support, because I need to say that we were talking with Alan and he noticed that moment and we all that noticed that now this is a moment for Ukrainians to be so exhausted that we need something to, to help their imagination to create their real future. And we have a power to, to fulfill all our plans. <laughs> and maybe we need some kind of support. And today we have 100 and uh, now at the end, we have 160 person. And at the beginning, we had uh, almost 300 person here. And I hope that this uh, collective mind um, will spread out of this borders the new idea about futures by the way we were looking for a ukrainian variant of translation the word futures because it's rather difficult in ukrainian language we have only future but we found we have found and now i think to use this uh, word more often thank you for all the participants for your patience too and thank you for your hearts Thank you for your messages in the chat. Now, Marcus and Alan, you can uh, read the chat with the uh, feedbacks, thanks, and etc. cetera, uh, in the chat. And uh, Maya, thank you for translating Ukrainian uh, messages uh, to Marcus and uh, Alan. Uh, and thank you for all our partners. You see all the um, uh, symbols of our partners on the uh, broadca broadcasting. Uh, thank you for everyone who trying to to push and at the same time to stand and at the same time to support 
uh, Ukrainian future as a part of the international future of the world world's future. So yeah. this is this is it. <laughs> Goodbye to everyone. You want to say something, Marcus? Yeah, please welcome. <laughs> I was just saying thank you and goodbye. I was just being happy to to have um, really engaged with some of your issues and to be so warmly welcomed. I'm looking at all the lovely messages on the site here on the screen, which is just, you know, it's delightful. And I now know the Ukrainian word for thank you, which I can see there. Now I have to go and work out how to say it. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. And somebody mentioned that today's meeting is like thought provoking. It's perfect. It's perfect word, which can yeah. symbolize today's our meeting. Uh, Alan's questions, all our all questions from Alan and uh, thoughts from Alan, thoughts from you, and information from you, and our communication, and even technical uh, obstacles. They were very thought provoking. Thank you for that. A pleasure. Thank you. And I look forward to joining you again at some point. This will be a lot of fun. And maybe we can organize it also so that uh, I don't know whether you run online workshops. I'm assuming that's kind of like what Saturday mornings are with Alan. Some of these tools can easily be used in a workshop uh, online. We don't have to do them face to face. Thank you. Thank you.